Thank you. Welcome to uh, this webinar and our apologies for starting late. Uh, allow me to uh, just introduce some uh, um, quick uh, setups for all of us. So if you have any questions during the webinar, you'll be able to put your questions in the chat. We have interpretation for this webinar in English and French. You can pick at the bottom of the, uh, the screen on your right hand side, click on the interpretation button and select which language you would like to listen the webinar in and you'll be able to listen in that language. We'll also like to thank all of our panelists who have dedicated their time to be here with us today for this webinar on uh, instant and inclusive payment systems and financial inclusion. And we hope that through the discussion, we'll be able to uh, provide some uh, information and also start discussion on this topic. And I'm really thankful that uh, to be your host today and uh, hopefully we'll be able to go through all of our agenda together. So before we dive into it, I'd like to mention that we are working with the uh, Alliance of Digital uh, uh, Finance Associations and Sarah Crawley is my co-host for this event. And we're looking forward to building a partnership, a uh, long lasting partnership. So Sarah, if you allow me, I'll pass it on to you for opening remarks and we can move forward. To you, Sarah. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone uh, joining us today for the webinar. It's really exciting to be here. Uh, the Alliance of Digital Finance Associations is the voice of the digital finance profession. So we are connecting um, in-country digital finance associations from across the globe, but particularly with a focus in Africa and Asia. Uh, we are trying to bring a community of digital finance professionals together to discuss the important issues that are affecting us um, in our countries and in our profession. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to be here in partnership um, with, uh, with African Ender today and also with Digital Frontiers Institute as well. So the Alliance is being incubated by Digital Frontiers Institute um, and part of the role of Digital Frontiers Institute is to bring um, online courses such as um, in digital finance and IIPS. And we're also building a community of digital finance professionals as well. And we're delighted to start to share that community and um, with Africa Nenda and also be able to ensure that some of the skills and knowledge and things that we talk around are actually implemented in country, particularly in regards to incident and interoperable and payment systems, which is what we're here to discuss today. So thank you, Sabine, for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And I'm sure we will have a long and lasting partnership as we move forward in building more uh, knowledge on instant and inclusive payment system. It's interesting when I say to people, oh, I work at African Inda and we work on IIPS, the question always comes, what is IIPS? What does that mean? You know, instant inclusive payment system. It is a mouthful, there's no doubt about it. So I'm so happy to have Xavier Martin here with me on this panel to share more about uh, instant and inclusive payment systems. Xavier is the Divisional Director at Digital Frontier Institute. And let's see if we can all speak the same language after Xavier goes through, you know, what an instant and inclusive payment system is and what are some of the primary steps to design and implement this type of system. Xavier, to you. Thank you, Sabine. So I think that uh, we can differentiate between instant and inclusive, no? the two parts no? that are crucial to, to this definition. No? I think that from a very practical point of view, uh, the instant part of the definition is very clear. No? We are talking about retail payments that are uh, processed in real time. No? So that means that the money is available immediately for the recipient and also systems that you can access them anytime, no? 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So they are always available and the recipient receive the money instantly. No? So that's, that's the instant part. No? That's uh, probably what, what one characteristic of this system is that they work a little bit differently than the traditional uh, batch systems that we're used to or the car systems or the large value systems in the sense that Usually, instant payment systems, they require like a direct credit transfer, no? what we know uh, typically as push payments. No? So that would be probably the, the, the main difference. No? And, and also the fact that the mobile tends to be the, the main channel for this type of payment system. 
But what I think that makes uh, this type of systems particularly interesting is the second word that you mentioned, no? the part of inclusivity, no? the inclusive payment systems. No? So I think that these systems are particularly interesting because they facilitate or they have the potential to facilitate the type of small dollar uh, mobile payments uh, that we uh, usually see for low income customers to use more often. No? So, and that's what it makes it particularly powerful no? because uh, instant payment often enable these digital uh, mobile services that, that help poor people to really into, enter the world of, of formal financial services. So that will be for me in terms of a short definition of uh, how I at least I understand instant and inclusive payment system. So if you want that I elaborate a little bit more, Sabine, I can I can elaborate a little bit more, or if you have any question, I can I can take it from there. Sure. I think it would be interesting to maybe help us understand what are the design steps if you are planning to implement a payment system, what do you, would you need to consider to make it inclusive? I, I will say here that uh, mainly the, the first important element, and here we have uh, many experts that are actually doing that. So I really don't want to <laughs> stop over of them because I know that they have much more experience, uh, practical experience that I have. But for me, at least from a from a conceptual point of view, no, there is like a very clear three, at least three different clear moments or steps, no, in the design of uh, IIPS, no. And first of all, the most important part is to to have like like a common problem that you want to solve, no? This kind of uh, shared vision of what you want to to accomplish, no? And here, usually, what we have found in many countries is that you need some kind of force driving uh, this initiative, no? It sometimes uh, could be the, the the central bank, sometimes it's the uh, banking association, but but you need to to have like this common language that we were talking before, no? And and identify what's uh, the failure in the market that you really want to try to solve, no? So what's the, the, the problem and what's the vision that you have, no? So that's, that's the basics to really uh, start there, no? In terms of the step one, no? And I think that from there, uh, what, what you need, and it's here where things become sometimes a little bit complicated, it's to define, no, uh, the areas where you will be collaborating with other uh, or other uh, players, no, and the areas that will uh, you, you will be competing, no, and starting to develop all the uh, governance, ownership rules, all the economic model of the system, how the uh, of the switch will work, no, which time, which type of interoperabilities we will uh, focus on. So that's that's the design of the system, no, and. And finally, uh, the, the test of the market, no? Market, uh, see if, if the product and the scheme that you have developed really have the acceptance from the public, no? And, 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 and really you get the scale that is needed to really make this uh, system uh, viable, no? So that's the, that's the test, no? Sometimes you, you have it all, no? you have a, very, uh, a system that is, works very well, very interoperable, but if you don't have the traction and you don't have the scale that you need, no, uh, that's where many systems uh, fail, no. So I think that in terms of steps, I will say that at least, no, you have these clear three steps. So maybe you can share with us, Xavier, what you are doing at DFI to contribute to that body of knowledge on instant and inclusive payment systems. Excellent. Thank you, Sabine, for for the question and for giving the opportunity to do like a one minute pitch about it because what we are doing at IIP at DFI, we have a program that we are so lucky to be a sponsor for the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's a program that really wants to uh, get everybody that is involved in payments to have a better understanding about the principles that are behind of this type of systems that really they know a little bit more about the different uh, components no? from the technology behind it, from the regulatory implications, and also the the different price models, the business of it, no? And, and we go into a very detailed uh, program with several courses, seminars, no? And it's an opportunity of uh, people like maybe some of the attendees today in the call that really want to know a little bit more on it, no? Re really to, to, to take the courses and, and, and really see uh, a little bit more about that. 
there is a web page. I will just put the link on the on the chat. And if anybody is interested to know a little bit more about this program, I they are more than welcome to join. Thank you very much, Xavier. It's a really, really pleasure to have you on the call here. And I'm sure during the QA we we'll have a lot of questions. But you mentioned, you know, we need to have a common problem to solve. And I have to say today for us and for African and in general is financial inclusion of all Africans. So to that effect, I am really happy to have a concrete example, as you mentioned, on the line with us with uh, Archie, who is the CEO of Gibbs, the Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement system and Ghana has done a lot of work on the financial inclusion and an instant payment and the role that has played in, in, in financial inclusion in Ghana and Archie it would be great for you to share the journey uh, for instant payment in Ghana and the innovations that you have spearheaded with Gibbs. Archie to you, you are still on mute and I'll ask uh, my colleagues to roll down the presentation for Archie, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Sabine, and a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I hope I have control over the slides now. All right. If not, we will roll them up for you. Okay. All right. Probably if we move to the next slide, as, uh, I think I have only 10 minutes. Is that right? Yes. Right, okay, so very quickly to showcase that uh, these are the services that we have before the real-time payment system started. The RTGS uh, reside at the central bank and we missed one square box. Before checks, we actually had um, a biometric uh, retail and banking uh, platform for, what the, for the informal sector. And we modernized the check clearing system in Ghana such that we have standard. And then we also have express. So checks are cleared within four hours. And we also modernized the ACH uh, clearing house, both for direct credit and for direct debit, um, for standard as well as express. And we are now currently working on the ACH near real time so that uh, ACH transactions can be effected within um, 15 minutes. <clears throat> We moved on to modernize uh, to actually have our own homegrown EMV card uh, scheme, sorry, uh, which we christened GH Link uh, uh, card. But uh, you very quickly realize that all these uh, payment platforms are bank based. And we realized that if you move on to the next slide very quickly, we realized that um, there was um, growth in the express uh, check clearing. Um, tremendous growth as well in the ACH as well. And there was, at that time, there was popularity amongst a few telcos that started the wallet system. We were mindful of what was happening in, the, in Nigeria with regards to their instant pay as well as the UK. And it was very clear to us that the world was gravitating towards real time. It was obvious that one is able to order things, but we are not able to pay instantly. And the world is moving to the stage where instant payment was becoming the order of the day. If we could please move on to the next slide. So somewhere around 2015, we embarked on our journey to implement the real-time payment system in Ghana, which we christened uh, the GIP, that's a Gibbs instant pay. It was initially bank-based, interoperable amongst all banks, funds were applied immediately to the beneficiary. Uh, it was CD denominated and it worked 24 seven as has been said already. But as I indicated, it was purely bank based. I'm trying to go through, I have about 15 slides. I'm trying to go through them as quickly as possible. So our real time uh, journey started with bank based. <clears throat> but before then we had to choose a model. You have three models. It can either be bilateral, multilateral or a central hub. It was very quick for us to realize that if you want to opt for the bilateral, once you have more than three entities, it's not cost effective. And if you opt for a multilateral where one entity connects to a number of uh, financial um, entities, what tends to happen is that they tend to cherry pick and it doesn't make it financially inclusive. However, when you have a national, you, you adopt the national approach where all financial institutions, all mobile 
uh, money companies and all fintechs connect to you, then everybody would have access to all bank accounts and all wallets in the system. And as a result, uh, Ghana, we opt for the, uh, the central approach. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, maybe you might have to click the, the whole slide so we have a, the whole thing together. And I would explain everything once it's done. Please continue. Okay, no, the previous slide. Yes, okay, so we stop there. So if you look at the, at the top, um, I mentioned that we had a, an e-switch platform that we were using for the informal sector initially before we started the journey of modernizing our checks. And that platform was uh, fully interoperable, which means that you can actually use the uh, the e-switch uh, cards from one bank to another. You can move to any of the financial institutions and still have access to your funds and perform all the various transactions. So within the e-switch e -switch platform, it was fully interoperable. Then in 2016, we started our GIP that interconnected all banks together. Then somewhere along the journey, we also uh, added the, the mobile wallets as well. And then we interconnected the e-switch platform to the bank world, and then from the bank world to the mobile world, and then from the mobile world to the uh, e-switch platform. So as we speak in Ghana now, we are our payment platforms, which is the e-switch, the bank world, and the mobile money world are all fully interoperable. And that's we christian the financial inclusion uh, triangle. So if you have fund, if you have funds in a bank account, you are able to move it seamlessly into any individual with an e-switch uh, smart card or into any wallet, <clears throat> as the case might be, and, and vice versa. So our financial our uh, uh, systems are all fully connected uh, in in Ghana. If we kindly move on to the next slide. Okay, then we started onto the overlays. The first thing we did was to introduce what we call the universal QR code. Now, why is it the universal QR code works or rides on the instant pay rails? If you look at the GHQR, that's our universal QR code, you see black and white big max that is linked to either a bank account or to a wallet account. So if you're in the formal sector, you're a merchant, it will be linked to your merchant bank account. If you're in the informal sector and you own a wallet merchant account, it will also be, it can also be linked to it. But what is interesting is that you have an associated number at the bottom. So if you have a smartphone, you are able to scan the black and, black and white bitmarks and make payments. On the other hand, if you have a feature phone, you can then use the number underneath and also effect uh, 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 payments. It works on the user side. It works on all the mobile apps as well as the USSDs. So within the country, it doesn't matter which bank or which wallet account you are with or which fintech wallet as well you are with, we are all able to transact seamlessly uh, uh, amongst ourselves. So the bank world and the on-bank world are able to transact as the case is. And the GHQR code as well is free for, for customers. And that is what is driving usage in, 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 in the country. So that's the first overlay that we did. Um, we're also mindful of the fact that although we introduced the GIP and it was bank account based, as a result of the mobile wallet usage in the country, Every, we are all used to using telephone numbers as our key field in, in transacting. So we introduce proxy pay, which is more or less an alias where you can link your telephone number to your bank account and you are able to effect payment on the personal level. You are also able to link the name of your company to your, um, what do you call it, your uh, merchant bank account number. So if your company is called uh, ISA, for example, you can register or link ISA to your bank account. And anytime anybody types in ISA, payments can equally uh, be effected. 
and that also that uh, uh, takes us or relieves us away from the use of point of sale, which you and I know is very expensive. And for the merchant, it's very simple, and they receive access to their funds instantly, and they can uh, transact uh, immediately. Um, next slide. We then introduce uh, a request to pay. I believe we don't have that slide there, but never mind. A request to pay, which is currently being used by merchants as well as uh, utility companies as well. We then introduce the merchant uh, gateway as well for retailers, um, very, very similar to e-commerce. In the e-commerce world, you use cards uh, uh, to effect payments. However, this is uh, the merchant gateway is the e-commerce within the real-time environment. So once you've gone through the various uh, options and you come to a total, you are able to effect payment directly from your wallet account or your bank account, and the business will be able to receive their funds uh, instantly. We intend to use uh, this particular payment for the um, airline industry as well as business to business industry. And that's the area that we want to drive it. And uh, of course, the, the, the repetitive payment environment like water, electricity, insurance, et cetera. If we move on to the next slide, please. Then um, what we've realized in Ghana is that um, when it comes to mobile wallets, where everybody is gravitating to us, you, we have a situation where bank account holders, in addition, also have uh, a wallet account because within the wallet environment, it's very easy to transact. And uh, as a result of that, um, you realize that I might be a bank account holder, but I would also have a, a mobile wallet account. And mobile wallet accounts are currently offered by the telcos and one fintech in the country. So the banks are not able to participate in that space. If you go to the previous slide, that's what I'm on now. As a result of that, the Bankers Association approached Gibbs and asked us if we could come up with a bank-wide wallet, which we have christened Ghana Pay, and we are yet to launch it um, uh, in May, uh, maybe in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, the banks, for one, so if you are a bank customer now, once we launch it, instead of uh, a bank customer going for a telco wallet or a fintech wa wallet, they can go for their own bank's wallet. Um, equally, we realize that when it comes to financial inclusion, uh, banks are not able to participate actively in Ghana, except the banks that are active within the e-switch world. But the e-switch world works on biometric card as well as biometric pulses, which is very expensive. So with the introduction of the Ghana P, which is the bank-wide wallet, it would enable banks to now have a solution, a platform where they can also offer it to uh, the informal sector. So they will also be playing a very active role uh, in ensuring that we address the informal sector as i.e. financial inclusion uh, that we are rightly uh, uh, talking about. So we intend to launch this bank-wide wallet that would help us along the way uh, 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 in, in May. Um, next slide. Okay, that's the rollout. On the sending side, at the sending side on the right hand side, we have all the universal banks, the savings and loans, as well as the rural banks. We have roughly 100 and something plus rural banks. Um, all of the uh, customers of the banks, savings and loans, and rural banks are able to effect real time transactions. Uh, mobile money operators are also able to effect uh, real-time transactions. The EMIs, that's the electronic money issuers, which is mobile money companies, are also able to effect and send accordingly. The PSPs, that's the uh, uh, fintechs, who are able to come up with um, solutions appropriate for various uh, corporates or merchant areas, their customers are also able to effect, and then the biometric card uh, East, which is also able to effect. On the receiving side, it's very much the same, except the uh, PSPs are exempted because they, they do not hold, um, or, uh, what do you call it, um, the, the appropriate license 
to hold funds. So their customers are not able to receive, but they are able to send. So most of the PSP customers might either have a mobile wallet account or a bank account or an e-switch uh, wallet uh, account. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, I've actually uh, made mention of the fact that we have 24 banks, um, a number of uh, uh, savings and loans, and then we have the rural banks are represented by Apex, one body there, but there are about 129 rural banks behind each of them. Um, in terms of the PSPs, the fintechs, we roughly have 15 in the country. They indirectly are connected to gifts through a settlement bank. And when it comes to the mobile money companies as well in Ghana, we have five. But the key thing is that we are all able to interplay within the ecosystem in the real time environment. So Actually, irrespective of whichever, please I'm go really ahead. I'm really saying, yeah, your time is coming up. And I think okay. uh, during the Q&A session, people will have a lot of uh, opportunities to ask more questions. So if you could potentially wrap it up, then we can Okay, I think I'm moving on to the next, last slide or so. If, awesome. If, yes, okay. So these are graphs to show volumes. You can see that 2018, 2019, wow. something happened in 2020. And it was around that time we have COVID and that was when the real use came. And if you remember in Ghana, we set our fees to zero for three months. And that was what caused the, uh, the blip there. And we also changed our pricing model from sender paying to receiver institution paying. So that's what that accounts for the high volume in the M2M uh, environment. And then if you look at the values, the next slide, you can study that for yourself. The next slide as well. And, I, and that's it. Thank you. So in summary, that's our journey uh, in Ghana. Thank you very what, much. What a journey, Archie. Thank you so much for sharing with us. So not only instant payment, inclusive, but a lot of innovation, request to pay. Uh, you had also proxy alias. You had an interoperable QR code. So a lot has happened in Ghana and a lot of innovation through instant payment. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. We believe at Africa Nenda that instant and inclusive payment system are really truly the gateway to financial inclusion to all, for all Africa and at least facilitating access to financial services. And we believe that interoperability is that engine that's needed because if you ask me and I'm making $2 a day to go and open an account with several uh, um, service providers just to be able to transact with people who are not in my network, it, it is really hard. And I really would appreciate Gertrude if you can share with us a little bit on the journey for Malawi and how instant payment and interoperability particularly can support financial inclusion within the market. Gertrude, to you. Thank you very much, Sabine. Yes, uh, Malawi implemented a national switch and this national switch is also an all-inclusive national switch. And when we're talking about all-inclusive, we're talking about participation on the national switch is not restricted to only commercial banks, but it is open to and banks, financial institutions. So currently in Malawi, we have got all the commercial banks integrated to the national switch. We have got all the mobile money operators integrated to the national switch. We also have got uh, microfinancing, insti uh, microfinancing institutions and savings and credit, credit cooperatives through an MFI technology hub that was uh, an infrastructure that was provided to them, integrated also to the national switch. How does this affect financial inclusion? As you are all aware of the fact that when we're talking about financial inclusion, we're talking about people that are in low income uh, section. And uh, most of the times these people are very vulnerable, meaning that anything that shakes them probably makes them to self exclude or actually they are forced to be excluded from financial inclusion. Now, currently in Malawi, what we have is we have all the transaction infrastructure available that is provided by the digital financial service providers available to all consumers in the country. So uh, the consumers are spoiled for choice as to what they use in terms of payments, transfer of value and so forth. They can use any digital platform that is on offer by any uh, digital financial service provider. Now, when it comes to financial inclusion, the reason why most of the um, 
are the uh, most of the vulnerable uh, demographics that we're working with, why they, they, they're so much interested in using cash for payments is basically because it is instant, it is convenient, and so forth. Now, when we are replacing cash, we have to replace with something that is not only similar to cash payments, but also something that offers more and more. Now, when it comes to digitization of payments and interoperability, we are replacing with uh, a platform and services that offer more than what cash can do. In terms of convenience, what we're saying is the infrastructure or the infrastructure for it all uh, financial institutions is open for all consumers. And uh, that means that uh, uh, consumers can send money to each other virtually, and they can also receive uh, virtually as well. Not only that, um, the secluded segments of, uh, of the population in the sub-Saharan countries, including Malawi, means that uh, they are transacting with low value transactions, and but these are high value kind of transactions. So most of the uh, digital pay, uh, the, the financial institutions, they're not interested in those kind of transactions. They want to follow the big monies and so forth. Now, when you digitize and you provide interoperability in these switches, that are available, they are meant to process high, uh, high volume transactions that are low volume. Now for the consumers, what it does to them is now they're building up credit history. So it's not just a question of them just accessing um, digital payments and so forth, but they're building up that uh, credit history for themselves to enable them to access further uh, other financial services from the exchange of those, uh, uh, those values that they're carrying out. So convenience is one of the main factors that has brought in most of the consumers into formal financial services in the country. The other aspect is uh, where we're talking about uh, cost effectiveness. Uh, the digital financial service providers in Malawi now are sharing a common digital platform that is offering interoperability of transaction across networks. Now, um, we all know the cost that is associated, uh, associated with the uh, handling of, uh, of, uh, of cash. Now, uh, when people are digitized, consumers are digitized or payments are digitized, we are slowly resolving issues to do with cost that is associated with that cash payments. In addition to that, uh, through a regulation by the Central Bank of Malawi, Reserve Bank of Malawi, they came out with a policy document which says that all transactions that are acquired on POS of any bank, consumer, those transactions are free for consumers. So that cost element is being removed slowly and it is uh, also contributing to adoption of uh, uh, digital payment uh, systems in the country by the consumers. In doing so, we are resolving issues to do with financial inclusion. Um, it has already been said to say these transactions are instant and being inclusive and so forth then it's not a question of people looking for their own service providers infrastructure. They can use any infrastructure. And uh, I've already talked about issues to do with, you can track these transactions and for the consumer side of it, they're able to build up their credit, uh, credit, uh, credit history. The other element that has also helped in Malawi is uh, natural literacy. Because although we, uh, in as much as we're talking about putting up all this infrastructure and so forth, the, uh, we noted that in Malawi, there were issues to do with financial literacy, people being able, not only understanding what financial services are, but now we, we're bringing another level of digitizing those services. And uh, uh, through the Reserve Bank of Malawi, which is the central bank in Malawi, we came up with a financial literacy, uh, literacy program to, to try and educate and impart skills to the low income earners, to make sure that they're able to manage their financials properly, but also and to, to increase awareness on digital payment systems in the country and all the developments around digitization of payments that were taking place uh, in the country. Um, at the time that uh, we went into uh, uh, putting up infrastructure for interoperability in Malawi, we had no, the, the payments act, uh, the payments laws were not yet enacted. And uh, for us, we really had to find ways on how we can, uh, we can, we, we can work around uh, having a, a, a legal framework as well as a regulatory framework to make sure that uh, we still go on and implement a national switch and uh, have everyone integrated to the national switch. 
Thank you, Sabine. Thank you very much, Gertrude. So the journey, uh, I think Xavier had mentioned uh, before, understanding the common problem and rallying all the different stakeholders. And of course, there needs to be also the legal environment that supports the uh, interoperability set up in their system. So thank you very much, Gertrude. And for us, when we're talking about inside an inclusive payment system, of course, at a domestic level within a country, we're looking at interoperability, but we're also looking at regional schemes. How do we also uh, promote inside an inclusive payment system from a regional perspective. I'm really happy to have ruling groups with us today from Banks of Africa to maybe dive into the journey in SADC for TCIB. Ruling to you, and I'm hoping that you can share with us uh, through that journey, you know, what, the, what are some of the benefits and the challenges that you've faced in installing this regional instant payment system, and also some of the design choices you had to make. Ruling to you. Thank you, Sabine. Um, yeah, I'll try to uh, summarize. It's been quite a journey. Um, and as you might be familiar, uh, TCIB as a cross-border uh, uh, real-time uh, service uh, went live uh, last year in July, um, where we've uh, formally processed our first uh, cross-border transaction between a participant, uh, which was a non-bank participant, um, a wallet provider in Namibia and a bank in Zimbabwe, which was a momentous occasion for us to celebrate, uh, proving that uh, we can provide for and facilitate uh, cross-border payments uh, between uh, the traditional banking environment and the, the non-traditional e-wallet provide, uh, provider community. Um, since since uh, inception um, and our go live, um, we've experienced uh, quite a few, uh, few interesting challenges, but also uh, been, we've just realized the opportunities um, that uh, comes along with uh, developing a cross-border instant payments um, uh, a payment service. But over and above that, um, I mean, there's quite a few benefits in our view um, and why, why such a journey um, is, is, is so important. And I think just to summarize it, um, First of all, it gives us an opportunity for setting goals uh, for real impact. Um, whether uh, I mean, earlier today we've heard about uh, the starting point, uh, trying to solve for a common problem. And, and our common problem that we've uh, focused on when we uh, set off with the design was very much focused around uh, cross-border remittance type payments, uh, person to person, and trying to solve for some of the barriers around the speed, transparency, uh, the cost involved in that. And also, how do you facilitate the payment service and introduce a payment service out in a community um, where there's inherent trust, but most importantly, creating free access to the broader community and market at large uh, through facilitating the, uh, um, a interoperable network of service providers. And our goal ultimately in that was to make sure that we can actually provide an enabling platform on which we could actually foster and build um, this interoperable network. I think one of the key benefits that, uh, that we mustn't lose sight of is um, the way in which once we clear around what we're trying to solve for and what our goals is and what, what will actually result in a real impact. And I think we're all around the webinar today is, is, is very much focused around driving uh, financial inclusion and making sure that uh, there's, there's free access to these type of services all around. Is the way in which we have the ability to forge uh, new ways to do things, uh, whether that is um, through forging uh, new types of relationships. Um, I mean, I think uh, over the years, uh, cross-border type payments has, has been happening, whether it's been happening through informal channels or through more formalized channels, uh, through closed loop uh, solutions that's being provided out there. Um, solving for specific goals gives us the opportunity to sit back and actually really start thinking about how do we collaborate for a better impact and for us to uh, serve out our goals. And that ultimately was always about a broad-based interoperability that we're trying to bring about. The catalyst for bigger and better things, I think, and that's probably where we see the opportunities on a day-to-day -day basis. It says once you've laid the foundation, um, the opportunities to further develop and enhance 
um, the proposition um, as well as uh, relationships in a collaborative way uh, becomes to the fore. I think there's quite a few uh, interesting and new developments that's happening across uh, across our region, and um, we need to learn how to get to come together and actually collaborate for these type of networks to be more interoperable to provide that access uh, where it's most needed. Uh, the sustainability and viability. Um, Having the ability to provide for a single infrastructure, um, lower, uh, a lower cost base shared by a broader uh, network uh, of users, the economies of scales that's brought about it helps us to actually drive down the cost that actually uh, gets uh, pushed uh, towards the, the end consumer. Um, and having the ability to facilitate uh, all these uh, transactions and the interactions facilitated through this network uh, through a single infrastructure is always uh, always beneficial. Focus development of the value proposition. Uh, yet again, um, uh, gradually but surely, uh, the development, ongoing development of the proposition for the network in itself, whether it's through creating different levels of interoperability and collaboration between networks, or whether it is uh, ultimately through um, through uh, uh, you know innovative enhancements to the services and. Um, that can be brought to the broader market through the financial institutions. Um, this platform does give us that opportunity to actually collaboratively sit around the table and actually have those, those discussions and actually move this forward as, as a community of users. Definitely, um, just in, in summary, um, I think what's quite important um, um, in terms of the development, um, having a regulate, regulatory endorsed um, um, uh, scheme in itself uh, with the regulatory endorsement and support um, and also the oversight through the, um, the payment system oversight committee provides not only regulatory certainty, but also helps us to advance the, uh, uh, the goals around the public good, uh, which we, we ultimately treasure in every single facet of what we do. Um, Having the ability to provide an authentic uh, governance framework, uh, which is uh, member led at the end of the day, where members can actually come around the table and collaborate uh, for a better future is, is ultimately key. Um, and it sets the platform for, for broad based collaboration and also for us to actually face the challenges that, and barriers that uh, we got so accustomed to. Uh, a common value proposition, uh, a compelling value uh, proposition. Utmost important, um, there has to be value in the system. Um, it makes it difficult, and I'll share a little bit about that later on in terms of the challenges as well, making sure that there is a real commercial value in the design of the system and the service. And like I've already noted, a centralized hosted operation uh, that can function on a 24 by seven with full support uh, is always beneficial. It's always on um, and always available. When we go to some of the challenges, um, I think because at the regional level um, and, each re and, and, and each regional setup will, will, will introduce its own unique, uh, uh, unique and complex uh, uh, variables. But I think ultimate, ultimately, this is quite important, um, even when you go through your design and there's, there's different design choices that has to be made that you take cognizance of these uh, because they do pr prove to become quite uh, challenging um, if they're not addressed. I mean, ultimately from a static perspective, we are faced with a multi-currency uh, uh, environment, um, a, a voluntary subscription model. Uh, we've provided for a level of flexibility within the network uh, where there's choice, although governed through uh, a multilateral agreement in terms of its rules and its constitution, there is some flexibility built in for for choice in terms of who do we interoperate with at the end of the day, but also um, uh, the domestic regulatory alignment that also uh, been in its essence, it just takes what you normally would face from a domestic perspective and it just multiplies it by the number of member countries uh, that uh, is involved and in our instance, uh, 15. Um, and also what uh, given the multi-currency also uh, uh, several settlement options that uh, has to be provided for uh, uh, for uh, the different corridors that um, 
we are targeting. There's always a little bit of legacy. Um, Cross-border transactions are not new, like I said uh, earlier. Um, commercial closed loop and informal offerings have matured over time, which is uh, which is is life. Um, there's definitely some challenges in terms of the shift. And like I said earlier, the benefits uh, being forging new types of relationships and different capacities through your participation model um, is, is, is vital. But what it also does is introduce some complexity and challenges uh, in terms of us finding our space between where do we collaborate and where do we uh, compete. And, and um, throughout this process, you will find that when although you've set your participation in your entry criteria at, at ground level and at equal par throughout the process, everybody is not equal and, and not equal because of the fact of uh, uh, levels of maturity. Prerequisites and conditions of the market. Um, and, and, and it talks back to my point just earlier, new entrant maturity and readiness. Um, uh, service offerings are not matured. Uh, uh, a new environment creates new challenges for, for for new entrants and participants within the system and we should always be ready to support and enable uh, and uh, those participants uh, within those environments um, and also the regulatory like regulatory barriers um, um, that 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 imposes certain restrictions on uh, on on the consumer out there in the market and their ability to to make use of some of these services also needs to be addressed as long along with the ability of the service providers to actually get the services to the market. And understanding these prerequisites and conditions are very important and has to be filtered into your design choices at the end of the day. Finding the balance during development. This is something that uh, uh, we had lots of discussions about um, throughout the development journey of TCIB and the extent to which the different the key domains have to be aligned um, and brought in balance while you're designing and developing your, your instant payments uh, system, especially from a cross-border perspective, is very important because the starting being having a starting point of having common goals is a good starting point. But then making sure that those uh, goals and objectives are filtered through every single facet of your design, whether it's at regulatory uh, level, whether it's at uh, commercial market level, or whether at uh, your technical operational level is vital and getting that sequence of activity um, um, aligned is quite important and I'll share a little bit now around that. Migration and appeal um, is difficult for most most of uh, the existing uh, arrangements um, to, to be broken off. Um, this is a brand new interoperable space in which all financial institutions can actively partake to provide uh, innovative services to, uh, to the market, given the conditions within those markets. Um, but there's, like I said, there's existing service offerings that is, uh, that's delivered value to the communities at large, at different levels. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to actually step out, out of current relationships and into new relationships, and into new models. Um, so yeah, so that's definitely something that uh, needs to be considered at, at, at all times. Um, and yeah, there's familiarity with, with current offerings, uh, current um, uh, offerings that it's not that easy to um, just to break off. Um, and yeah, the question always remains about who moves first, you know, um, being a new offering. Um, there's, there's quite a, a, a long list of, of, of active discussions that's happening at the moment, but there's always, always uh, the question about the first mover um, and uh, ultimately uh, being a two-sided model. Uh, it's important to have a fair balance of sending and receiving uh, participants to, to join uh, the network to, to create the interoperability effect at the end of the day. Rilling, we're getting right on time there. Excellent. I'll just sum up with the last two slides. Um, yeah, I think I, I've just I touched on it and it was specifically around the design considerations. Um, and in our design journey and our development journey, we always had to balance these three, three environments. Um, um, first of all, we had to provide for the regulatory adherence and compliance in order to fu uh, fundamentally gain the support, uh, market uh, representation through a recognized governance body um, that gave the members a platform or say that, uh, to what the scheme and service should be and do. 
And then ultimately the commercial value proposition for Melente, there should be appeal and use for the service um, at commercial level. In the last slide, um, but I would like to share the next slide. Um, and that's just some food for thought. Um, because there's no, there's no, in our view, there's no right or wrong answer in this, but programmatic alignment uh, during your development stages of your market domains, your regulatory domains and your technology domains is, is quite vital. And what comes first and what comes last um, although there's no right or wrong answers, I mean, everybody has taken different approaches. I think what is key, uh, key in this is um, it makes the world of, world of difference in terms of your success at the end of the day. At the point where you go live, if one of these three domains haven't properly been mobilized or any one of these conditions haven't necessarily been set and agreed, it does prove uh, difficult to, to actually um, get get one or two of these domains activated and moving uh, off that. So we've got to find that right sweet spot in terms of the alignment. So when the day when you go into your run mode and you go live, that all three of these domains are at the level of uh, comfort and, uh, uh, and, and, and maturity to actually be receptive to, to your service that you're offering to the market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruling. I, I do uh, understand that this has not been a, a simple journey. I mean, uh, multiple countries, multiple currency, different systems, and appreciate what you said about finding the balance and also looking at where do we collaborate and where it becomes a competitive space for all parties to join. I think here I would like to shift gear a little bit and understand the perspective of a funder who has actually supported these initiatives, these instant and inclusive payment systems, whether they were at the domestic level or at the regional level. And I'm really happy to have Dili Abera with us, who's a program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dili, it would be great to hear from you, you know, for what what is it that uh, you have learned through the, the journey of uh, prospecting and supporting to accelerate these IIPS systems um, and also help us understand what are some of the possible developments in the coming year from your perspective as a funder. Mm -hmm. Dili, to you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sabine. And uh, thanks for inviting me to um, participate in this webinar. Um, in order to answer your question around um, prospecting opportunities or how we accelerate IIPS and some of the great potentials on the continent, I think as a funder, uh, it would be important for me to explain some of the goals and outcomes that the Financial Services for the Poor program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is uh, seeking to achieve by partnering with uh, grantees such as African Enda and others on the continent uh, and elsewhere. So uh, in terms of our goals, the Financial Services for the Poor program or what we call FSP, uh, our goal is that by 2030, 80% of adults worldwide and 60% of those uh, adults living on less than $2 a day have and um, actively use a digital account to make payments and also access additional products. Uh, by 2030, we also want to see the gender gap in usage eliminated. That's a, a very important uh, aspect of our strategy. Ultimately, um, the impact that we seek is that we want fewer people to slide into poverty and more people to move out of poverty and stay out of poverty. We want to uh, see households be able to use digital financial services to manage and recover from income and expense shocks and be better able to acquire assets that helps them improve their long-term income prospects uh, and income generation. Uh, that said, um, per the uh, 2017 Global Findex data, we know that 1.7 uh, billion adults worldwide are unbanked uh, or financially excluded, meaning that they have no access to financial services. Uh, of those that are unbanked worldwide, uh, adults, approximately 400 million adults uh, live in, in Africa. And moreover, um, of the world's, uh, moreover, 70% of the Af Africa's unbanked adults live in extreme poverty or under $2 a day. So looking at the current rate of financial access progress or financial inclusion progress in Africa, uh, which, is, which has been about 4% since uh, 2011, we, in, and looking at projections, universal financial access on the continent will not be achieved uh, way beyond 2050. And this is uh, unacceptable. And I'm sure many of you 
uh, participating here uh, would agree with that statement. So the question uh, that we ask ourselves and the question that I think everybody needs to ask is how do we scale and accelerate our efforts to get to 100% of African adults becoming financially included by 2030? Um, one way which has been said time and again on this call from uh, my colleagues in, in Malawi, Ghana and others is to enable access and use of digital financial services. Um, some of you have already mentioned this, but we know that uh, high cost of delivery makes it difficult and challenging for traditional banks and systems to serve the poor sustainably. And we know that digital means can solve this issue by cutting out nearly, um, studies show that nearly 90% of the cost of delivery. And this really forms the basis for FSB's strategy and funding focus in Africa um, and also Asia. So uh, FSP strategy is grounded in the belief of three things. One, that low cost formal digital financial products can help the poor withstand shocks and capture opportunities to move out of poverty. That pro poor digital payment systems or what we have been calling instant and inclusive payment systems or uh, previously real time retail payment systems are required to enable the private sector to deliver such products to the poor at scale. And last but not least, um, enabling regulations are necessary to allow both banks and licensed and non-bank providers to reach, this, to reach and serve the poor. So with the focus of enabling uh, greater and greater access and use of finan digital financial services, uh, particularly women on the continent, the FSP program aims to achieve its 2030 goals uh, by prospecting and partnering with grantees uh, and others on the continent to, that, that do one of two things. One is uh, provide deep engagement projects in five of our focus countries in Africa, uh, namely Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And also, or aim to scale and accelerate uh, proper payment systems and the related policy and regulatory harmonization uh, work at the regional and continental level um, such as the work that's being done and mentioned this in the SADC region with the SADC TSIP and others. Um, so this is uh, pretty much in terms of prospecting. These are the things that we look at um, and it's driven by our strategy. Um, and we work across both country level as well as regional and continental level on the continent. Um, in terms of uh, possible developments in the coming years, um, there's many that have been mentioned here, many that are already in flight on the continent. Uh, very exciting to see all of that um, happening. And it really what, what excites me about the whole prospect or what, what is potentially possible is, um, again, the projects that are, have been showcased here, but many more that are out there looking to build uh, and enable instant and inclusive payment systems across the continent. And moreover, um, there are a number of conversations and efforts that are trying to, both at the regional continental level, that is increasing the prospect of Africa being covered sort of by a mesh of interconnected and interoperable instant and inclusive payment systems that at the end of the day, uh, our goal is to enable 100% of African adults to become financially included by 2030. Thank you, back to you, Sabine. Thank you very much, Dilly. All right, but we are, we've gone full circle, a national IIPS, Ghana, a regional IIPS, TCB in the SADC region, and we've also heard from uh, Malawi, we've heard from a funder on a perspective on IIPS. We are right at the point of a Q&A. A so couple questions here that I have for our panelists that I will share. And then of course, if you have more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I think the first question we had is for you, uh, Xavier, it's related to cost being a barrier to access payment systems. So although I would like you to answer that, but I also want uh, both Archie and Rowling to, to to give their sense on that question about cost making payment accessible. Xavier, to you. Oh, I think I lost Xavier in the process. All right. Archie, how about you start with the question about cost? Well, um, Sabine, are we talking about setup cost or running cost? I think in this question, this question is coming from Jonathan from uh, i would say from a customer perspective maybe running costs 
software and setup, and then give us also the perspective on the setup side. Well, one of the beauty of the uh, real-time uh, operations is that the running cost is cheaper than the, um, the CARDS environment, apart from the obvious advantages that we've all spoken about, in the sense that uh, banks will not need to give you a card. You can either use your own phone. Uh, uh, if you have a, a feature phone, use a USSD uh, part of it. And if you have a smartphone, use the, 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 the mobile app part. When it comes to payments as well, because we have the QR code, uh, the cost of uh, the point mm -hmm. of sale is no longer required. So the setup cost is very low, and therefore the operational cost is equally very low as well. As well. That's why we are able to introduce things like free um, usage, because the setup cost is so low. Uh, we are able to strike a deal with the bank such that the floats that the banks have could be used to offset majority of the cost. And that's why we are able to reduce the cost. And once you've reduced the cost of operations, it then becomes appropriate for, uh, becomes an appropriate tool for financial inclusion because it's easier to, um, to, 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 to use. And also in the real time world, the scheme belongs to the country, uh, not uh, an international scheme or uh, somebody else who would then dictate the cost of operations. So you can decide as a country to offset the cost and make transactions free for everyone. So what, that's one of the key advantages of the, of the real-time environment. The, uh, so the, both the setup cost as well as operational cost is far, far, far cheaper than the CARDS environment or the clearinghouse environment as the case is. Well, Ruling, you wanna give us your take on that question? Yeah, I think uh, I touched on it uh, a bit earlier as well. I think I uh, absolutely agree. It, it starts with uh, keeping your development cost uh, as low as possible. Um, uh, at, from, from the start, I mean, if that's your, your goal, that your departure point um, to provide a low cost service, um, you, you need to make clever choices in terms of your enablement as well as your operating cost. Um, and that's something that uh, I believe we've managed to uh, keep as low as possible to actually provide a, 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 a very reasonable uh, um, price point to the financial institution so that that's not carried over. In a cross-border space, then we know the contribution, uh, there's, there's other factors that also contributes to the, the cost to the end consumer, uh, some of the regulatory compliance uh, related costs as well as the, the FX uh, conversion cost that also needs to be looked at. But nevertheless, uh, I mean, it starts somewhere. Um, if you start in the middle and you start breeding the low cost environment, single infrastructure through which we can share um, a, a big network of transactions through, I mean, ultimately your processing cost becomes as low as you will, you, you need to get it. And uh, that is the beauty of, 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 of creating broad-based interoperability on a single network or in single infrastructure. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rolling. This question is for you, Archie, but I will also ask uh, Gertrude and Sarah to chime in on the question. What are your thoughts on the future of instant and inclusive payment system and integration with the emerging technologies such as blockchain, distributed ledger technology, and central bank digital currency? Loaded question, I would say. Archie? <laughs> I think um, in, in Ghana, we are currently exploring the CBDC. And in the, in the initial discussions, it's, it's obvious that they will run on wallet systems. And real time happens to also run on wallet systems. So it's, it's obvious that uh, the current infrastructure should be able to support the some of the future initiatives in, in that regard. Um, you you are you rightly know that when it comes to um, the the the, the real time environment, the, the processing is different from the cards, but the real time mimics the the future of of payment in same in terms of CBDCs. So I think and I strongly believe that there are synergies that can be harnessed. Uh, in, in, in that regard. Thank you.
Gertrude, you would you like to chime in? Uh, yes, please, Sabine. Uh, yes, this is really interesting. Uh, this is something that we're really looking into, especially when it comes to the cross-border uh, remittances, the international remittances, whereby the national switch is being used as a clearing agent. Uh, we're also looking at uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology for such projects as uh, digitization of government payments, where these payments get to be switched through the national switch. So all these, and the reason why we would want to try blockchain and distributed ledger technology is because of the traceability of these transactions. Uh, uh, blockchain is the best when it comes for you to track, uh, uh, to, to keep records, uh, audit trails and so forth. So it is easier to trace those kind of transactions. So for those main projects, uh, digitization of government payments, uh, as well as for uh, cross-border remittances and international remittances, definitely would want to consider blockchain technologies. Thank you. All right. Sarah, would you like to add something? Sure. I just say the one thing we all know is that what, what happened yesterday is not going to happen necessarily tomorrow. So whatever instant and inclusive payment systems we're um, we're putting together, we have to be thinking about what is the next thing that's going to come our way. You know, CBDC mm. is just one of those things. There's going to be many Especially, more. Yes. Um, and, and we have to be open to a, you know whatever whatever comes our way, I think, in order to keep being instant and inclusive. Otherwise, we suddenly become exclusive again, which is exactly what we we don't want and so I think very much we need to be aware and and also thinking about it from the user's perspective you know that they don't really care whether they're using a card their mobile phone a QR code uh, you know CBDC it's actually about them just being able to transfer money from or pay a bill um, so we very much need to also think about it from um, a user perspective and, and, and make sure that we have as many use cases as possible to encourage people to be more digital and, and meet those targets that Dilly was speaking about earlier. Thank you very much. Uh, Dilly, I am going to ask you also to chime on this question since we had asked you about future developments. So thoughts about, you know, whether it's blockchain, it's CBDC, it's DLT. Yeah, I think um, most of it has already been said. Uh, we at the foundation, of course, as, as funders um, and looking at what to fund are also hearing these, these things come up, CBDCs, all the innovations, the blockchains and so forth. So we are constantly um, you know, discussing that, learning, trying to learn from the ground and from the field and what, what's you know, sort of uh, important to, to um, the, the people on the ground. So uh, we haven't done funding in this area yet, but it is an emerging area that we're very much paying attention to and likely will we'll support uh, depending on what the market says. Wonderful. Thank you very much. We have a question from Juliet, and this is for you, Gertrude and uh, Archie. Just uh, give us quickly, uh, what is the uh, ownership and governance of the switches in Malawi and also in Ghana? Arch Gertrude, would you like to start? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sabine. And uh, uh, Just to give you a quick background, uh, the, switch, uh, uh, the switch in Malawi was fully funded by the government of Malawi through uh, a soft loan that they got from the World Bank Group. But nonetheless, although it was fully funded by the government, the government of Malawi, it is fully owned by the private sector. All the participants on the national switch own shareholding into the national switch uh, with equal shareholding, meaning that they all have got equal uh, voting rights. And uh, the government of Malawi or the Reserve Bank of Malawi did not take up any ownership in the national switch. So the national switch in Malawi, it is owned and governed by the members themselves. Thank you, I hope I've answered that question. Thank you very much. Archie, would you like to chime in? Governance and ownership of GIPS. Yeah, in terms of the ownership, um, I think the banks in Ghana initially were not too much in favor of, the, of it. So the central bank took the initiative and, and set up a wholly owned subsidiary. A private company fully 100% owned by the Central Bank of Ghana. However, when it comes to the, the governance in terms of the board membership, we have representations from the, uh, the banking sector, uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, business, as well as the legal and finance sector. So that's where we are now. Uh, lately, uh, we've gotten to the stage where the banks are now interested because they've realized that the dependency on the national switch is going to, it is, it, it's, uh, it is very much very close now. An example is where we are now, where we've come together 
and we are uh, actually implementing a, a bank-wide wallet uh, between ourselves and we are building a new uh, building etc and we're coming up with so many initiatives between uh, the two parties so the central bank is also taking their time to make sure that uh, the price gives appropriately now before uh, uh, offloading shares to the bank so we are in the process now uh, of doing the right thing but uh, we 100 percent support the fact that it must be owned by the participants with maybe uh, central banks influence as well because of the uh, public good nature that might, uh, 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 might, might become relevant going forward. Uh, thank you. Which is part of that inclusivity and, and leveling the yes, playing uh, field for all participants. Yes, Wonderful. There's another question for you, Archie, uh, and this is what are some of the main blocks that prevent all financial service providers to integrate the national instant payment system in Ghana if they are not yet? Not quite sure if, but are there any blocks for any uh, service provider who's not necessarily your typical bank, so non-bank uh, service providers to integrate the national switch? No, as we speak, um all financial institutions, all mobile uh, wallet companies, mobile phone, uh, mobile money companies, as well as the um, the fintechs are, are connected uh, to the national switch. So there isn't any uh, in, in technological institution, financial institution that is excluded. Um, as we all know, when it comes to we, we, we what we did was we set up a, we set a standard for integrating, and once you conform to it and you integrate. Uh, then you are you are good to go. So nobody is excluded in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. We have received more questions, and we'll be make sure to revert back to those questions with some answers. Uh, I would like to maybe give the opportunity to you, Robert, to uh, maybe uh, uh, share with us some of the insights from this discussion and and some of the closing words. So we are close on time, and again, our apologies for starting a bit delayed. Robert, to you. You're on mute. Thank you, Sabine. I thought uh, I was sitting back and uh, taking it easy today and learning a lot. Uh, first of all, let me start by um, thanking everybody. I think what a, a fantastic panel. And I think the way it's been put together really does uh, give a sense of the work that's going on on the continent, the level of innovation, uh, the level of knowledge uh, and, and content. So really uh, starting off on that, on that footing, I wanted just to congratulate uh, the panelists. We've got regional systems we've got very strong good examples of instant and inclusive payment systems which which actually uh, touch on some of the core principles uh, that we as Africa Nenda also look forward to, to uh, we also thrive uh, and, and look look uh, to drive because we believe this is how uh, we shall move uh, the continent forward I think Dili mentioned the 400 million Africans 60% uh, of whom are women who are financially excluded today uh, and we believe that we've heard uh, what success looks like. So uh, one of the key things that we believe at Africa Nenda is really to, to do what we call knowledge sharing, uh, taking best practice uh, from the continent uh, and really taking those examples to other countries uh, because I think there's a lot more similarity, a lot more understanding. So that's one of the critical areas uh, that, that we, uh, we, we, we strive for as, 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 we, uh, as we drive our agenda. Uh, today, I think we've um, gone through and or in a sense of uh, what we mean by instant and inclusive payment systems. You've heard about that initial jump, I think in 2020, uh, when Gibbs moved to uh, you know, remove fees and also changing the model from a payer to a receiver uh, model. I think those are some critical learnings uh, that we can pick up. Um, we've also understood that there's need to balance uh, and look at different models uh, of ownership. Uh, so uh, Malawi's shared a very great example of a private sector uh, owned. Uh, and I think Ghana then goes to share how uh, regulation should be used to drive, uh, you know, instant payment systems. So I think this is also a very strong uh, learning. Uh, I loved the financial inclusion triangle because I think that is one area for me, which uh, as we speak to stakeholders to tell them what exactly is the financial what do we mean by instant and inclusive payment systems? That simple one slide uh, speaks volumes where you've got the card, uh, you've got banking, uh, and you've seen the different models in Africa where some countries are still only integrating uh, banks and they've not brought in uh, cards. And indeed they've not even brought in 
the mobile uh, players. So that simple uh, financial inclusion triangle to me uh, sets, sets a, a very strong foundation uh, for growth. Uh, I also like the, 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 the overlay of services because I think this is critical. It's not a static journey. Uh, we move on to QR code, uh, which of course has significant impact. And I think the, the challenges we got today from what's happening uh, in, in the TISIP, which is also very important as we move towards the continental free trade area, uh, we all understand that Africa needs to come together uh, under a certain, certain payments arrangements. And I think uh, Dilly mentioned whether, you know, what will that look like in future? But I think we've got a great example and congratulate the team from TISIP for the first transaction, which I think is, is phenomenal uh, between, I think you mentioned Namibia uh, and Zimbabwe. And we want to take from that, take those learnings and again, drive it within uh, the SADC region as we as we move towards uh, real time real time payments, but are also cross border. Um, so for me, uh, at, uh, you know, the, the, the last thing I'd like to say, if I may, um, is 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 as we drive our agenda, I think we find ourselves in a very good, uh, good, 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 good uh, point. Um, one of the key lessons we've learned uh, from 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 the work that we're doing is that there's need to strengthen political economy. We need to strengthen technical expertise. Uh, we, of course, as African Ender, get involved in pre-project support uh, and knowledge sharing. And I think today is a clear example of, of how we're doing that. And, and therefore, when we do this work, we don't need to go too far. And that's why one of the reasons uh, we've brought this panel together is because we believe as strategic uh, partners, we will learn uh, from, from examples that are on the continent that should make it easier for us as we move forward uh, and share best practice uh, with others uh, in other regions. So I think we've got a very strong foundation. Um, I'd like to leave you with a, with a small proverb, which um, I, I, I picked up just as I was thinking through the session, because I think a lot of times on the continent, uh, the story is told uh, from other lenses. And today uh, you, you're hearing the story from a very, very uh, rich and African uh, led perspective. And therefore uh, this great proverb uh, for those who, who, who remember uh, one of, well, I think one of my favorite authors says that until the lion have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I think today we've seen uh, a great example of, uh, of the lion uh, beginning to tell a history of the hunt. Uh, so I'd like to just thank uh, this great panelists and uh, you know, for an amazing session. And I think our work is made much easier because we have uh, you know, critical stakeholders who know what they're talking about, who can help us uh, tell the story. So thank you very much. Uh, and I also want to thank Sarah, Sabine uh, for an excellent uh, moderation. Uh, Dilly as well, thank you for your insights. I think you've helped us uh, understand not just uh, you know, what you're looking at today, but also uh, what the continent can do in terms of positioning itself uh, for the future. So I'll stop there and say thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, what a closing uh, uh, statement. I would like to just add a couple lines. First of all, I'd like to thank the participant who have endured us and uh, participated in this conversation. Thank you very much. I'd like to let you know that this is the beginning of a discussion and the beginning of a journey with Africa Nenda, an instant and inclusive payment system. Look out for the state of instant and inclusive payment system in Africa report, which will be coming Coming out in October this year, and you will we, we will of course highlight Gibbs in Ghana, and we'll also highlight TC with Bank Surf. So you will have more information and more knowledge will be available on these national and regional IIPS systems across Africa. And we hope that this will contribute to even more knowledge. So feel free to share with us any information that you have there at info at africanenda.org. We are here to listen. You will also receive a mini survey for you as an opportunity to give us feedback, on not only on this event, but help us uh, improve the future events and the future webinars that you are going to be seeing happening this year, ranging from gender, from MSMEs and digital trade, from cybersecurity and also also from CBDC throughout the year. We're looking forward to engaging with you. Thank you very much, Archie, Ruling, Dilly, Gertrude, Sarah, Zaye, and of course yourself, Robert, and the whole African Ender team was behind the scene and has contributed to putting this event together. Thank you very much, and we wish you a good day. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.